naturally. Okay? It's something that is taught. You know, and they talk about being slain in the spirit. Well, if you're in the spirit, you're alive. You ain't dead. Sorry. <laughs> you know, or they're we're drunk in the spirit. Nowhere in the scriptures does it tell you to get drunk in the spirit. Okay, it says, be not drunk with wine, wearing his excess. Okay, but be renewed with the Holy Spirit. Okay, not drunk in the spirit. Doesn't say that anywhere. Okay, speaking in tongues. You've got a whole chapter in First Corinthians that lays down exactly. Okay, Paul says, yep, yeah, don't don't forbid to speak in tongues. But here's what needs to be followed if you're going to do it. I have been places where they're speaking in tongues and not once have they ever obeyed what is written down in 1 Corinthians. Not once. They are swaying back and forth like at a rock concert. They are swaying. They are dancing. Okay, they're making their, their personal connection. They're having their visions. They're hearing their voices, you know, and so on and so forth. To the point to where they are susceptible and open now to demonic spirit influences. Remember the story of one fellow going to one of those healing tents. I think it was Wes was telling the story. This guy was relating it. How they had him all worked up and he went up there. He, had, he was born with one arm shorter than the other. As he stood up there, he said, I'm telling you right now, I watched my arm grow. You know, of course it didn't. After he came down and got off of there, and after he got off his demonic high, the other arm was still as short as the other. You know, or the funny one that I, I even saw the film of this, where a guy goes, I think it, uh, what was it? I can't think of the charlatan there, one of those so called faith healers. Guy goes up there, you know, and he's got glasses on as thick as the bottom of a Coke bottle. You know, and he goes up, you know, and the guy, you know, and whatever, and the guy takes, can you see? Can you, got the, yeah, I can see. I can see. You know, and the, the, the cameraman makes the mistake of following him as he goes to walk off the stage, and he gets over to where the stairs are, and he stops and puts the glasses back on. You know, like, oh, that was short-lived. You know. All of this is nothing more than carnal, fleshly behavior, enhanced by worldly, sensuous music. <coughs> you know, facts for these people are not important. Facts aren't anything <coughs> that are to be believed. You can lay the facts out there for them, and it. I, I, I've heard it said, well, I don't care what the Bible says. I believe this. Okay. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, don't, I don't care what you, I, I experienced this. I know you can have a lot of experiences. All right? Ask anybody that's done drugs. <laughs> You can experience all kinds of interesting little things. <coughs> you know? Ask alcoholics. You know? Ask, you know, I mean, you don't even have to get into the hard stuff. Just ask somebody that, you know, that, that has been smoking marijuana all their life. Okay. About things that they imagine. You know, while we're on that subject, you know, I'm, you know, one of my favorite subjects to beat up on, you know, the lies about marijuana. You know, and the long-term effects of marijuana, well, it's medical marijuana. I'm taking it for my health. You know. Yeah, that's like grandpa's cough medicine. Who do you think you're kidding? You know, <laughs> you know like, uh, I want to date myself here. You know, John Wayne's movie, she wore a yellow ribbon, the sergeant, and rescued the little kids, and he got his little nip in there. And, you know, I'm so, I gotta take my medicine. <laughs> oh, it tastes terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh-huh. Long-term marijuana use will cause you to lose your appetite, cause you to lose sleep, 
cause you to lose cognitive function. It will cause you to experience depression. Now, this is all medical fact. So, yeah, who, who, who's the medical expert that you're listening to? Okay, the people who used to be selling it on the street corners that now have licenses and shops? Okay, or some doctor who's had to deal with people uh, who have been dealing taking and using these drugs long term through their life and is trying to help me get their life straightened out. Not to mention the fact that hey, we've always called marijuana ever since I can remember the gateway drug because it always leads to stronger stuff. Because what happens is it doesn't make you feel good and high like it used to and you need something more. And so you're willing to try something more because you want to keep feeling good and what happens where the when you end up being an addict it's because you're, you're not taking it to feel good anymore you're taking it to keep from feeling bad that ought to tell you when you've got the problem yeah, but they're not interested in the facts you know, for example, you know, that, uh, you know, drunk as a skunk in the spirit, that's Ephesians 5, 8. You know, they misquote it. I heard a guy say that one time. And, oh, man, we were drunk as a skunk in the spirit. We were just leaning against the walls. And it's like, yeah, I used to see that stuff on the streets of the city of Chicago as a cop. All drug addicts. Okay, ain't nothing spiritual going on there. It's all about self. It's all about self. Look at me. Come to the show. Okay? It's all about this one upmanship. You know, a lot of these places they have people standing at the altar with blankets so that women, when they come down to lay on the floor, somebody had to come up with a blanket and cover them so that they're not exposing themselves and being indecent. What are you laying on the floor for to begin with? Get up! Well, wear your skirt long enough so that you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. You know, the question you got to ask these folks is, hey, does what happened in your services happen outside your services? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, does it happen when you're alone and at home in your prayer closet? Or when you're just out walking down the street? Well, no. No, because you don't have the right audience to perform for. Now, when the Holy Spirit does come on you, I don't care where you are. You could be in a grocery store. You can be at work. Uh, you could be at school. It doesn't matter. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, it comes on. And if you're a Spirit-led Christian, it ain't going to hinder you <laughs> at all. Uh, I tell you, we, we used to <laughs> I know people thought Wes and I were nuts at Lowe's. Yeah. I mean, could, uh, could we, something would get us and tickle us spiritually, and we'd be yelling and praising <laughs> the store. You know, shouting scripture back and forth. You know, people look at us like, hey, this is a crazy, you know, whatevers. You know, or, you know, praying without ceasing. I mean, that's spirit right there. You know, I, 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 so many Christians I, I, I've read stories about, and I've experienced myself just being in conversation with God all the time. I try to be keep myself cognizant and aware of the presence of the Lord with me all the time and talk to Him all the time. He wants our company. He wants our conversation. He wants our relationship with each other. Alright, I'll wind it up here. Facts have nothing to do with feelings. Now, facts you know, as I said before, we'll build your faith. 
and may very well result in legitimate feelings. Okay? But facts have nothing to do with feelings. Facts, not emotions, need to be our guide to our Christian behavior. It doesn't matter how I feel about something. I respond based upon the facts of what I know is so. Facts build faith. Okay? Facts build faith. When you take facts and you exercise faith in the facts and you see the result of your faith being exercised, that's when your feelings, great or small, are Holy Spirit driven. Because you can rejoice in the reality of, you know, good example, and I'll close with this, little baby August, got an update today. They've taken him out of ICU. <laughs> now he's still going to have to have a heart procedure in the future. But this little boy that we've been praying for for weeks now, who has a single chamber heart, I don't know how this kid's alive. God does. Why? Because people exercise faith in facts that God answers prayer. And that there is nothing too hard for our God. See, this is where you get tickled and get excited. This little baby boy who shouldn't even be alive is laughing, smiling. He's keeping his food down. He's able to take his medicine. And they were able to take him out of the ICU today. And the parents are just beside themselves. And thanking, thank you for your prayer. God, I mean, how are the doctors going to explain this to themselves? Your heart's supposed to have four chambers. He shouldn't even be alive. Praise God Almighty. Mm -hmm. Nothing too hard for our God. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your truth. We thank you, Lord, for hard facts that we rest our faith on. And when we exercise that faith in the facts, Lord, then we can find ourselves with emotions, whatever they are, that are legitimate and that are real because they are driven by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen and amen. Father, I pray, carry us safely now on our way as we go to our homes. Continue to bless our night. Give us a safe, quiet, peaceful night, Lord. Let us get the rest and healing we need for our bodies. Again, Lord, we pray for all those here in the church who aren't able to be here, Lord, because of sickness and illness. We pray, Father, for swift and complete healing. We love you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we love you, Holy Spirit of God. Bless us, Lord. Continue guide, encourage, and strengthen us, Lord, as we strive to fulfill your will in this world. And we pray and we ask for it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.